Hello everyone, yes, I'm back with another 3D printer review. It seems like I'm doing a lot of these lately, and you might be surprised to know that I get like a sponsorship request or a product review request almost every single day, which is crazy, and I turn most all of them down, but this one was interesting. This is a wacky, wacky printer. Um, it might look like a normal, you know, bed slinger printer, but this thing can do 300 millimeters a second on the printing, that's right. Um, has an introductory price of only $400. It has encoders on the X and the Y axis motors, which is interesting. And it has the most massive part cooling fan setup I've ever seen in any printer. So seriously, this thing is kind of wacky and has some really interesting features. So let's dig into the GTEC Thunder. Okay, so before we get into the review, let's talk about all the little basic things here. Um, they did provide this printer to me for review. There was no other monetary compensation whatsoever, and they really don't have any say whatsoever in this video, so I get to do whatever I want, as always. Um, secondly, I'm kind of throwing out my previous uh, review method for 3D printers. I think it just pissed people off more than anything. I'm just going to kind of focus more on who this printer is for, who it would be best suited for, who it's maybe not the best for, focus on the pros and then cons, and just kind of, you know, share some experiences that I've had with it and just get rid of the whole rating system. I think that was just kind of problematic for a lot of people. So completely different structure, and we're just going to kind of look at the printer and see how it performs all that good stuff. The last thing I should note about this is it is a Kickstarter thing. I know some people have some very, very strong feelings about this, and I'm not going to make any comment on that. Um, GTEC has been around for a while. They have a bunch of other printers, and they're just using Kickstarter to promote a new printer like so many other companies are doing. If you care about that, cool. If not, that's fine too, um, but this will be released as an introductory price of $399 on the Kickstarter. I am honestly not sure what it's going to be after that, but I'm going to call this $399 because that's what you can buy it for when this video releases. Most likely it will go up a little bit after that, as is the tradition of post-Kickstarter pricing. But if you want to buy one of these, it's going to be a Kickstarter type of thing, but I can tell you it does exist, um, you know, it is made. A lot of the new Kickstarters are doing this thing where they actually make the production run, pre-sell them, and then ramp up production, and, you know, maybe they ship in a month or something like that. So we will see, but be warned, this is a Kickstarter product. Uh, so let's dive into just some of the features and what is this thing. So I don't know if I've said it yet, but please feel free to use the chapters, skip around and find the sections that you're interested in. Um, let's talk about kind of the overall features of this thing. It is a um, traditional filament printer. You've got 250 by 250 by 260, so a relatively decent build volume. You know, it's not like a larger format, but it's, you know, slightly on the larger side of the average. Um, you have a Bowden style extruder. Um, you can see you have the extruder over here and then the head over here. And this is kind of like a Bond Tech clone. They claim the, um, you know, two dual metal drive gears. And it looks a lot like Bond Tech, but it's probably just a knockoff. Um, and it's, you know, decent little setup. You've got um, your general head here. This does kind of have a volcano style heater on it. Um, I'll take this off later and kind of show you, but it definitely has a much longer nozzle and a much larger heater core. That is how you're gonna support the 300 millimeters per second printing. It's got two um, really good sized layer cooling fans on there. And then you might be able to see it in the video. Back here on the back of the gantry, you have two 80 millimeter fans for additional part cooling. This thing gets really loud and can push a lot of air. In addition, on the um, X and the Y axis, you actually have Hall effect sensors on the back of these steppers. So yes, you have full closed loop on the X and the Y axis. I'm not exactly sure how they're doing that in software, how they're doing that in hardware. Um, they don't really go into any details, but there is a Hall effect sensor on the back of this that does provide feedback back to the electronics for positioning information. Um, it also has a really interesting Y axis. I'll show that later in the video. A lot more robust than a lot that I've seen. Really nice belt tensioning mechanisms on here and there's the other one over there. Um, it still does use the stupid little roller things um, against the extrusion, which do wear down over time, but that's pretty typical stuff. 
And then you also have optical um, sensors on the X, the Y, and the Z. Instead of the little clicky guys, you actually have these um, little opto gate sensors, which is interesting. They, um, I guess, theoretically could be a little bit more reliable. And then up front, you have a little kind of BL touch probe type thing. Although in the software and the configuration, this is really only used for initial bed leveling. And then after that, it uses the optical sensors for everything else. So it's kind of weird that it doesn't probe the bed before every print. It just does it for the initial bed leveling and then that's it. Um, dual Z drive, good metal construction. This is one of the kind of like, you know, beefier, chunkier printers that I've seen. And then you have a color touchscreen over there. I think that's pretty much all to talk about. Um, this does not have an all metal hot end, so you're limited to 250 degrees. Although the bed, which is one of these nice magnetic flexi beds, does get up to apparently 110. So yeah, that's what you're looking at in terms of features. Let's kind of go into the pros and the cons. So it might seem a little strange jumping straight to the pros and cons, but I kind of like to get the conclusion out of the way first, and then we can kind of go more into the deep dive. So. The pros of this printer is it's actually pretty nice to use. I kind of have a stupid fondness for this thing. It is kind of wacky and weird, and there's a lot of odd design decisions on this. But generally speaking, of all the 3D printers I've been reviewing lately, I actually really like this one. Um, the touchscreen is laid out relatively well. It's not my favorite touchscreen. It's a little bit dim and a little bit small, but it has all the features that you would need on it. I like that the ports are right out here in front. I like the tensioning mechanism. Mechanically, I really like the way this thing is built. It has these nice plates on the outside in addition to the extrusions being bolted on. Um, slightly bigger rail than normal. It just feels a little bit more robust and you know, a little bit more industrial than most, which is surprising considering the price. I love that it doesn't have the um, little spring tensioners that you have to manually level. It is a rigid bed that's on there. This build material is actually quite nice. This is one of the first ones I haven't had to throw some glue stick on to get things to stick. It works perfectly good with um, PLA. I've only tested it with PLA right now. So I really like the bed adhesion and you can theoretically print at 250 to 300 millimeters per second. I say, can in quotes because you know you're going to suffer some quality and i'll show you that later but if you are looking for a secondary printer like you know if you're kind of like me and you already have a prusa or something else and you're looking for a secondary printer that can just bang out parts but you really don't want to go the voron route because you're going to be spending what thousand fifteen hundred something like that on those if you just want a cheap printer that can just bang out some really 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 quick parts to prototype with this is great for that. Um, I think this is the main selling feature. This is who the printer is for. The fact that you can easily do 100 millimeters a second. Um, standard printers are going to do like 50. Um, I can push my Prusa to like 70 and still get pretty good results. But anything beyond that, you just can't heat the filament fast enough and you can't cool it fast enough. This can absolutely heat it fast enough and it can absolutely cool it fast enough. So you can push this really, really, really hard. Your quality suffers, but eh, you're still going to get a usable part that you can kind of prototype with. So I think that's who it's for. The printer does suffer from not really great print profiles. They're just kind of using Cura like everyone else and they have very generic print profiles that I think they just took the standard ones and then just said, oh, 250 is the print speed. And they didn't do much else. This requires some extra tuning to get better quality out of it at those higher speeds. So if you're someone that kind of likes tweaking and tinkering with it, this is also a great option for you. But overall, it is a very robust printer, and I think it's going to be good for a little bit more of the knowledgeable 3D printer that is looking to get something that is a little bit faster as a secondary printer for prototyping. It would work great as a primary printer as well, but it's going to need a little bit more tuning and a little bit more tweaking to get it to the same level as, let's say, like an Ender 3S1 or something like that at a similar price level. Okay, so let's talk about cons and who this printer might not be best for. In terms of actual print quality, it is very good, but for the same amount of money, you're gonna get better print quality out of like an Ender 3S1 or something similar to that. Um, you know, apples to apples, if you're printing PLA at 50 millimeters a second, 50 millimeters a second, you will get better print quality out of some other printers. However, this kind of brings more to the table with the speed and robustness and some of the other stuff. but 
pure print quality, you're going to get better bang for your buck elsewhere. I have a suspicion. I think the hardware is perfectly fine on this. I don't see any issues with that. I think it comes down to the print profiles. The print profiles were very generic and they didn't really seem well optimized or tuned for this printer. Creality is moving much more towards creating, you know, their own slicer, which is just based on Cura, but they have their own slicer. They have much better refined profiles, and I think that's how they're getting some of the extra quality out of it. If there was a community of people that wanted to put together a better print profile for this and start kind of tuning and tweaking it, I think you could easily get the same or similar print quality. But that kind of leads me into my next point. I don't think this is necessarily the best first person printer, uh, you know, beginner level printer. If you don't have a 3D printer and you're looking to get your very first one, I don't think this is really aimed at you. That's not to say that you couldn't get one and be perfectly successful. I think you could. It's um, actually pretty easy to get up and running, but there are potentially better options. I'm choosing my words carefully here because I know someone's going to buy it as a first printer and they're going to love it and they're going to type in the comments that it was perfectly fine for them. I 100% believe that that's going to happen, but I feel that there's better printers out there suited for that. I think this is much more geared, as I said previously, towards the more intermediate advanced user that is looking to kind of unlock some of those new features. This is the type of thing that you install Clipper on. This is the type of thing that you throw an accelerometer on the head. If you want to kind of tune and tweak this, this is the one that I would do versus the Ender. But if you have a beginner that's never going to touch that and doesn't even know what Clipper is, if you don't know what Clipper is, then maybe something like the Ender 3 is kind of a better option. So that's kind of where my head's at with that. Um, but other than that, I do enjoy this printer. I think, um, what are some of the little cons? I mentioned this previously. The touchscreen is okay, um, but it could be a little bit better. It's relatively small. It's relatively dim. You know, on the camera, it kind of doesn't really even show up that well. But it does function quite nice. The um, UI is great. Everything is decent about it. And I think the only other gripe that I have with this is, let me just unplug this and spin it around. Um, it has dual Z axis, but they're not linked in any way. So you can see they're just two completely separate um, Z axis lead screws. And the problem is I can easily push down on one side and you can easily get the gantry out of level. Um, a lot of the printers are fixing this by having a belt that runs between these to kind of keep them synced up. Now, when I start the next print on this, it's gonna go down, hit the optical, and it's gonna kind of re-level itself, but it's never gonna get to the same point that it was when I did the full automatic bed leveling. So I've kind of have to now go back and redo the bed leveling. And I think this is kind of a big problem because you can see I can, wobble and walk this thing down and that is a little bit of an issue but mechanically i think that's the only real big thing other than the wire maintenance isn't exactly my favorite everything is you know held in place nice enough but it's a little haphazard back here i think the last con worth talking about is the noise level the normally i just kind of throw this in there and be like ah, oh, it's a little bit loud it's a little bit quiet whatever this one's a bit different. Um, this is just kind of idling right now. We just kind of have the um, head heated up here. So let me just go and turn this thing on to show you what it's gonna sound like when it's actually printing at full blast. So we can go into prepare, let's heat everything up. And then now we're gonna turn on the fan. So that is the main cooling fan here. We don't have the back one on yet. Let's turn on the back one as well. So I'm not really sure how this is gonna show up on camera, but it is very, very loud. When I do these printer tests, usually I can't tell that the printer is going on outside here in the garage, but with this one, I can easily hear it inside the house. So if sound is a bit of a concern to you, you know, might be something you want to think about because this is by far the loudest printer I've ever encountered. And it's because it has these two massive cooling fans here and then two 80 millimeter fans in the back as well. Yeah, it's loud, but that's what you get. 
Okay, so let's test out the speed on this. There's a couple files on the SD card already. I'll test those, but I did a um, 20 millimeter calibration cube at the um, highest layer height in the slicer at 0.28. And we're gonna you know, turn this over to crazy speed mode. And we're gonna see if we can do a calibration cube in six minutes. So let's go to printing, uh, calibration cube, yes. And then here we need to select crazy mode. And then we'll see how this goes. Now, you gotta print a little bit hotter. So this is printing at 215. And this is why I'm saying that the print profile is really important because if you print this at the typical 200, 205, you're gonna get a lot of clogs because it's just not enough heat to melt it quick enough. So I'm not really sure what these slow, normal, fast, and crazy modes are doing. They kind of explain them a little bit, but theoretically it does some adjustments to make it actually print at these speeds. So. Let's see how this goes. Six minutes for a calibration cube. So obviously the first couple layers are gonna be a little bit slower and then the thing will go kind of crazy fast. So um, yeah, we'll see how it goes. It will produce something, I'm sure of it. There we go. So that knocking sound is actually the Z rod back here that is hitting against the top. And if I kind of isolate it, that sound goes away. The um, X axis is moving so quickly that when it goes back and forth, it's causing the top of that uh, rod to wobble. So interesting, it's just noise. It's not hurting anything, but definitely creating some wobble. Oof. So five and a half minutes. Let's see um, how it looks. Actually, it doesn't look too bad. Okay, it looks a little wonky. <laughs> so let's see here. Uh, 20.4, 20.5, 20.3. Twenty point two. So, you know, it's close enough. There's a lot of um, bulging on the sides. So that's actually 20 if I'm kind of measuring away from the bulges. 20.1. Yeah, 20.2. So it's relatively close. We'll take a closer look at this when we look at the test prints. Uh, let's do something else. Let's do vase mode. So this thing is really cool at vase mode because these things come on and you can do really quick spirals in vase. So let's um, do one of those that's loaded up on here. So this one's just called circle, the something circle. And like I said, it just kind of does a vase mode, but it's a little bit bigger so then the printer can actually get to some full acceleration. With something as small as the calibration cube, you really can't get to those full movement speeds like you would want to.
The first couple layers on this are a little bit boring since it's just kind of doing the bottom, but it starts to get interesting once it gets into the actual vase mode, so enjoy. So we're going to do one more layer, and then it's going to go into the spiral vase mode. But you can see it's, it's going pretty quick right now. It's actually laying down filament and don't seem to have any issues with it. So it looks good. And we're at 230 millimeters per second right now. And here's the spiral mode. So we ran into some jamming and some partial extrusion that you can see down here. I had to slow it down. We're sitting at about 160 millimeters per second. Um, and it seems to be okay, but it just doesn't really seem like this is able to keep up with it. So let's um, increase it a little bit. So now we're at 170. It seems okay. Nope. So I was able to print this successfully another time. Um, having an issue with this filament, I don't know if it needs to be printed hotter, what the deal is, but you know when you're printing at these speeds, a lot of factors come into play. I might have a partial clog in that nozzle that I gotta clean out, who knows, but it can do these speeds. It just takes a lot of hand holding and a lot of babysitting. All right, before I get to the print quality, I wanted to kind of take a couple of these pieces apart and show you what's going on. The um, head has some interesting guts in it, so let's take this apart and I'll show you what's going on in here. So that's what's going on inside this head. You have um, two big squirrel cage blower fans, and then you have the main cooling fan on this guy. Um, I'll yeah, see if I can get to that extruder, and then you have all, um, all these connections down here. Let's see if I can see if I can get that fan off, so we can look at the actual extruder. There we go. So here you can see the extruder, and down below there is actually a pretty large um, heater core. It's actually probably about about the size of volcano. Um, I'll snap a picture of it so you can see. It's going to be really hard to get the camera down in there, but this is what you're looking at. Um, it's all pretty well designed and put together in my opinion, and the heater block is quite large, so it should be able to support um, these faster speeds. I noticed on the um, actual extruder up here that it was kind of pushing in, pushing out. I think the retraction settings are maybe a bit too aggressive, and that's what's causing some of the issues. Who knows? But it's got a pretty decently built head, and with these dual fans, yeah, there's a lot of cooling going on. So the other thing I wanted to show are the encoders that are sitting on the back of the motor. Normally you just have the stepper motor. These actually have a encoder wired up as well. And I'm going to take that off and just kind of show you what's going on with that. But it's a Hall Effect sensor, which is kind of weird. It has a magnet on the back of it, and the Hall Effect will basically track the poles of the magnet. Now I say that's a bit weird um, because Hall Effect sensors, I haven't looked at the specs on this one specifically, but they don't have that much resolution, generally speaking. Um, so something like an optical encoder is going to have a lot more resolution to it. So I'm not really sure what they're doing here, but you can see the magnet um, sitting on it right there. And if we take this off, we've got the Hall Effect sensor that goes right against there. And that is, once again, measuring the um, rotational poles of this motor. So kind of interesting. You don't see this on any other printer. Lastly, look at, well, second to last, look at this y-axis. How crazy is that? You have the motor down here with um, another encoder, and then you have a belt reduction going up here, and then you have these two pillow blocks to support everything. And this is interesting because 
with um, bigger belts and bigger beds, you're seeing a lot more tension on this. And you don't really want to put that much tension on the axis, um, the shaft of the motor. You want this to be relatively low tension, but with all the belt tensioning that we're doing, it's putting a lot of um, pressure on those bearings. So this is actually a really nice setup. I don't know exactly what they're trying to accomplish with this, um, but yeah, having these two little pillow blocks and the reduction, Never seen anything like that before. And lastly, this is the afterburner um, or the big fan set up on the back. So this kind of blows air right underneath um, the front of the extruder and you've got two 80 millimeter fans on here. The interesting thing is these aren't um, controlled the same way that the layer cooling fan is you have to control these separately. So there's a separate G-code command. You can't do it in Cura. So really you just kind of have to either inject your own G-code in there or just manually turn these on with the touchscreen, which is kind of strange, but you know, big layer cooling fan right at the back, kind of interesting. So let's talk print quality. I'm gonna separate these out a little bit. So these were all printed with just the standard um, good settings. I actually had to go in and tweak the profile. And basically these are printed 50 millimeters a second, um, I think 80 millimeters a second infill, just nice standard 0.2 millimeter layer height stuff. If we look at the Benchy, it's good. There's no issues with it. It's exactly what you'd expect. There's um, you know a little bit more fuzzy details than what some of the other newer printers would show, um, comparing this to something like the Ender or the um, Prusa. It's just, you know, not as polished. You can see a little bit of wavies in there, but overall, very good. Um, there's a little bit of um, issue on the back of the smokestack, but, you know, perfectly acceptable. Looks like a good print. Um, if we look at the Matter Hackers Astronaut, once again, pretty good. Um, the underside of the hands looks really nice. The feet are really nice. And um, the visor is nice and clean. There's just a little bit of banding here and there, but overall pretty good. Now, if we look at uh, the Maker's Muse Clearance Castle, this one was a bit rough. Um, I had to actually break this free, um, the gate, is pretty much fused in place. I'd probably have to break it to get it out. And you um, can maybe see on the bottom of this, I had to really pry at that with a screwdriver. And I mean, it works, it, it works, but it's very sharp and it just kind of gets stuck in there. So yeah, the tolerances aren't super good and I wasn't um, surprised by any of this, but this one's probably the roughest clearance castle I've ever printed. And then on to this little printer test. This one came out pretty good. We get a little bit of ghosting and a little bit of fuzzing on the text on the front. Not too bad. Um, all of the fine details printed really without issue. They're maybe a little bit wobbly. Um, the bridging here is to be expected very good since this has such a good layer cooling fan. And as far as the overhang goes, this was probably one of the best I've seen. Um, you can see it doesn't really start to get away from it until right at that, you know, 75, 80% mark. It's really good all the way up until the very end and same with that one as well. And this is about the best I've ever seen on the overhangs. Um, but then we see a couple little weird issues like this. These aren't exactly circular. You can see there's a little bit of a gap between the inner and outer walls. They're a little bit ovaled. So that's kind of interesting. So overall, it is pretty good at, you know, standard settings that you would actually use. Super fast settings are a little bit different. Um, these are the 250 millimeters a second. This is the calibration cube. It looks pretty rough. Um, you definitely, the X kind of looks like a different font. Um, same with the Z, it looks just a little bit different. And you definitely see some missing extrusion there. Um, it was you know, partially clogged or wasn't able to actually produce it. You got a little bit of a pillowing on this. It did the thing. It made a cube that's relatively accurate, but just barely. 
Um, this is another Benchy that I printed. This is the stock um, profile that they have on the SD card, and you can see there's a lot of texturing down there on the bottom, a lot of texturing down there, and it looks like a Benchy. I've definitely seen worse on some of the 3D printing help subreddits, um, but it's, you know, it's not great. Um, but this also printed in 32 minutes, where this one printed in like two hours. So you do get a speed benefit, but you're going to get a significant reduction in quality from doing so. And if we look at the vase thing that I printed, it actually looks really good. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but if you look up close, there's definitely some wobbling in there, which, uh, you know, to be expected. What I'm suspecting is because it has those encoders on it, everything kind of seems to have a little bit of a pattern on it. And I don't think it's coming from the lead screws, which is the typical thing that you would see it from. I think it's coming from that compensation. If they're using those Hall Effect sensors in any way, it's trying to compensate for it. You can see it a little bit very up close here. I don't know if you can even see that on camera, a little bit of wiggling there. And it's just the same thing, more pronounced there. So as you go faster, it just gets more and more pronounced. So once again, I think with some tuning, I think this thing could actually do really well, but right now it just doesn't really have the um, profile or the software to go at these crazy, crazy speeds. So it's conclusion time. This is a really interesting printer that has a lot of technology in it. Um, I wish I had the time to flip it upside down, break open into the controller and see what's going on, but I think that'd just be another can of worms and this video is already far too long as it is. It's really well built, it's really robust, it's probably one of the best built um, inexpensive you know, uh, entry level printers that I've ever seen, especially with the optical switches, um, these nice big rails, the belt tensioning, it's really nice. I just think they're over-advertising it. Printing at 300 millimeters per second, it's just not happening. Um, I had a lot of struggles today um, trying to get those prints done right. I think you could easily call it 150 and people would still be happy at that extra speed. 150 millimeters per second, this should comfortably do, no problem. And that's still about three times faster than what most of the printers can do out there. I think it needs a little bit of tweaking with the firmware and it needs some massively upgraded and tuned printer profiles to really do what you want it to do. Um, that Benchy that I printed over here, this was using um, their stock profiles from Cura. So I just said, oh yeah, print me a Benchy at 0.2 millimeter layer height, and this were the default settings. So if this was the default print that you were getting out of it, that's kind of tricky. I actually had to go in and modify the profile to get it to print something more like this. So once again, not really the best printer for beginners, but you know, if you're someone that's been around the block a little bit like myself, it takes you yeah, five, 10 minutes to kind of modify the profile and get this thing working right. So yeah, that's my two cents. I think it's got great hardware. I think it's a really nice printer, um, but I think they're just eh, maybe selling it as a little bit faster than it is. and with a little bit of tuning, a little bit of tweaking, this would be a great machine. So as always, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.